Okay, can I have everybody's attention, please? I want to welcome you all. Um, I'm Mike Schill, and I'm president of the University of Oregon. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to a combined event, the Derek Bell Lecture in African, so Derek Bell Lecture and the African American Workshop and Lecture Series. Together, we're featuring Professor Keen Charles. Um, I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion and, and thank Guy uh, for coming to our campus and, and sharing with us uh, his insights. But I am not actually going to introduce Guy Charles. I am going to introduce Marcelin Burke. But before I get there, what I would also like to do is recognize uh, Janet Dewart Bell. Derek's son, Derek Bell. Derek, where are you? Derek Bell, we're Thank you both uh, for joining us tonight. You know, the, at the very end of my time at NYU, um, your dad, your former husband, uh, was a colleague of mine there, and uh, he was a wonderful man, and it's always a very, very special time to do this lecture where I get to remember him and we get to celebrate our former dean and former colleagues' uh, memory. Now the lecture series is also important because it brings people of a variety of perspectives, backgrounds, and beliefs together to help us work toward building a more inclusive and equitable society. And I want to thank Marcelin. Uh, the Dean of the UO School of Law, and Yvette Alex Asenso. Yvette, I saw you a moment ago. Where are you? There you are. Yvette Alex Asenso, our Vice President for Equity and Inclusion for their leadership in planning tonight's event. Now, with respect to the African American Workshop and Lecture Series, this is an effort that we started to support our commitment to bringing in experts on campus issues to explore issues around race, equity, inclusion, diversity, and the African American experience. Now the vision for the series goes hand in hand with the Derek Bell Lecture, so I'm really delighted that we can do this together. Uh, the lecture, the Derek Bell Lecture, was named after the first African American dean of the Uni University of Oregon School of Law, and it really bears um, a real testament to Derek Bell's legacy of integrity, his unwavering commitment to inclusion. And events like this are essential to our mission of education, research, and service, because to truly prepare students for success after they graduate from law school, we need to understand everyone. We need to understand the perspectives of everyone, and perhaps most important, we need to have people understand the role of race in our nation. And so this is a really, truly wonderful event. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Marcelin Burke, the Dave Frommeyer Chair in Leadership in the Law, who is now at day 169 of the Green and Yellow <laughs> Challenge. And if you don't know what that is, you can see and get on her Instagram. So, <laughs> thank you, President Schill, and thank you all for joining us this evening for the 2020 Derrick Bell Lecture. As the President said, this lecture is held in honor of Derrick Bell, who was the dean of this law school from 1980 to 1985, and he passed away in 2011. We hold this lecture to recognize his place in our history and the lasting and powerful effect that he had or impact that he had on American legal scholarship more generally. His insight, his activism, his engagement on issues of race and diversity and equality are legacy that we honor today. We celebrate his efforts by recognizing the centrality of diversity and inclusion and institutions of higher learning. For those of you who are not familiar with Dean Bell, I'd like to share a little bit of a story. 
As I said, he was the first African American to hold this office of dean, and he was one of the first people of color to serve as a law school dean at a non-historically black college or university. He held a number of academic appointments, including at Harvard and NYU law schools, and he's commonly recognized as one of the founders of critical race theory. As a lawyer with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Dean Bell saw firsthand the power of the law as a force for equality and for change in the context of public school desegregation. Much of his writing focused on the persistent and structural obstacles to achieving a truly substantively, to, to achieving truly substantive racial equality, equality in this country. His cautionary and sobering insights are instructive for even the present time. And thus, it is important for this law school and this university to continue to promote equality and community. And I thank President Schill for his commitment to this lecture series, and we're delighted that the Bell Lecture has become a part of his lecture series. And I also thank VP Yvette Alex Asenso, Alex Asenso for her leadership in this space. And so tonight, before we um, have the main lecture, I am honored to have Janet Bell with us tonight, and she is Derek Bell's widow, and she is a force in her own right. So I always feel kind of weird about introducing you as widow, because she is an author, um, she's a, a leader in leadership training and development, and she has written Lighting the Fires of Freedom, African American Women in the Civil Rights Movement. And as I had a chance to visit with her earlier today, I told her that just reading an excerpt of that actually brought me to tears. I mean, it's a really powerful um, statement about the role of African, Amer African American women in our civil rights movement. She's a communications strategist, a social justice advocate, an activist, an executive coach, a motivational speaker, and a broadcaster. She won an Emmy for Outstanding Individual Achievement as CBS commentator and also re received a Peabody Award for her work at National Public Radio. She is the founder and president of LEAD Intergenerational Solutions, Inc., which is a nonprofit dedicating to developing intergenerational leadership as social change agents. Please join me in welcoming Janet Bell. and Vice President for Equity and Inclusion, Yvette Alex Asanso. I, of course, uh, want to acknowledge again our son, Derek Bell III, and our special friends who made Eugene a wonderful place for Derek Bell and for his first wife, Jewel Hairston Bell, Art Johnson, and Anita Johnson, who are sitting over there. <laughs> Jewel Harrison Bell had died, so I never, I never met her. But from all accounts, she was an absolutely wonderful and remarkable person. And I would be remiss if I came to Eugene, Oregon, and did not acknowledge that she did the heavy lifting. <laughs> she was here uh, for the time when he was the dean. She was there when he became the first tenured professor at Harvard Law School. So we lift her up. She had an um, administrative position here at the university, well loved by everybody with whom she came into contact. You know, sometimes people say that a prophet is not acknowledged in his time. And that was the case often with Derek Bell. I go to, to events across the country, and most people, I think, got it. But some people now said, oh yeah, that bell, he was right. He, he did try to tell us and try to warn us about certain things that are happening now. But Derek really considered himself first and foremost a teacher. 
He thought that teaching was the highest calling. In that universal encyclopedia in the sky, next to mentor has to be a picture of Derek Bell. He lived to teach and teaching kept him alive for 10 years after he was diagnosed with a progressive and rare cancer that eventually took his life. He taught in many ways. He taught through his civil rights work, where he managed over 300 school desegregation courses. He taught when he integrated the University of Georgia, um, uh, when he helped integrate the universities of Georgia and Mississippi. He taught through his protests, whether they were at uh, Harvard or at Oregon. Uh, his writing really encompassed a large body of work from his casebook, Race, Racism, and American Law, from his first trade press book, And We Are Not Saved, to his last trade press book, Ethical Ambition, Living a Life of Meaning and Worth. Derek was a person of great character, vision, and service to generations of students I can't go anywhere in this country without finding someone who said, oh yes, I was a Derrick Bell student and really proud of it and trying to compete with the other Derrick Bell students <laughs> as to who really was his favorite. Um, Derrick was a complex, brilliant, beautiful human being whose life and legacy continue to inspire us. He was a religious man who never lost faith. He was an agitator who gave us hope, a strategist who gave us a playbook, a patriot, a war veteran, a true gentleman and scholar. While his predictions were sometimes quite dire, he never gave in to cynicism and despair. He, we, <coughs> lived joy in the midst of struggle. I want to thank the University of Oregon for honoring him with this lecture and for those of you who carry on his work. And I'd like to say that Professor Guy Uriel Charles is the perfect choice for the Derek Bell Lecture. Now, last night uh, I finished um, a reading at the Tsunami Bookstore and I sang, and by popular request, <laughs> I'm just going to sing the last the last stanza of this song. Because despite it all, and we have many challenges, that I just want to leave you with the hope and with the joy and with the inspiration that Derek gave me every day. What a privilege, what a privilege to have known this man. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Thank you. Thank you. 
He is also a great scholar, having published more than 30 articles in top law journals, and he's the co-author of two leading case books and two edited volumes. He has been a visiting professor, as I said, at Harvard, Berkeley, Georgetown, Virginia, and Columbia. And before uh, Professor Charles comes up to speak, I'd like to also thank several people in their offices for helping bring this great evening together. Again, I thank President Schill for his vision and commitment to this effort. I thank the UO Division of Equity and Inclusion under VP Alex Asenso's leadership, Eugene Weekly, Tsunami Books, um, and also within uh, the law school, I want to thank Associate Dean Professor Stuart Chen and Jennifer Geller, as well as Anna Sherwood and uh, Raina Jackson. And then in addition to acknowledging Derek Bell III, who has been here um, with us um, every year, I want to thank again Art and Anita Johnson, as well as Judge Ann Aiken. Uh, that have been great supporters of this lecture and great supporters of the law school. Now, just pause to say that, you know, when I first started, before I even started here at the law school, one of our African American alums remarked that I was the first. And he was correct, but not for the reason that he thought, mm -hmm. right? He thought that I was the first black dean, the first African American dean of the law school, and that's not true. I am the first African American woman to lead this great law school. But indeed, I am standing on his shoulders. And he had a great impact, though I never had the privilege of meeting him, um, a great impact on my life as a law student, as a lawyer, as a professor, and now as dean. So I could not be prouder to welcome to the podium for our 2020 Derek Bell Lecture, Professor Guy Charles. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you all. Um, I'd like to thank President Schell. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Burke. I'd like to thank Vice President um, Alex Senso um, for all of your wonderful and warm welcome, and to all of you and this great community, this wonderful law school, to present uh, the Derek Bell Lecture. And of course, Dr. Bell, um, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's been amazing to watch you. This is not, was not the first opportunity I've had to hear you speak, uh, and it's wonderful to be in your presence. Um, I learned race and law from, Derek's Bell, from Derek Bell's casebook. Uh, I was taught uh, by a wonderful uh, professor um, who at the time was, um, was leading the NAACP. Um, Derek Bell was one of the first invitee, I think he was the first invitee, to the conference uh, that I helped co-organize as a student uh, when we founded the Michigan Journal of Race and Law that was inspired by Derrick Bell's work. And, when, and Derrick Bell was the keynote speaker at that conference in a room that was completely packed with people. Uh, and he sang. Uh, that, how, that is how he opened his keynote. So it is fitting, Dr. Bell, <laughs> that you ended by singing. I am not going to sing. <laughs> I don't have the confidence of Derek Bell. Um, what I'm going to do this evening, I'm going to do two things. The first is I'm going to articulate what I think of as the five Bellian principles or axioms. Uh, one of the things that so, it was so fascinating to me uh, was how Derek Bell, um, when he came to this conference, uh, he spent time with us as students. So for those of you who are students uh, in this room, uh, particularly for those of you who are African-American students, um, Derek took time to talk to us and uh, share his wisdom with us. Uh, he took time to affirm us. And so before starting and thinking about the Bellian principles, I also want to take time uh, to affirm those of you who are students in this room this evening. Uh, to let you know that you count, that you matter, that your views matter, and that you are indeed difference makers. Uh, nobody knew what many of us who were in that room were going to do, 
uh, when we were students in law school, uh, trying to organize a conference and calling and writing. There was, this is not the, the time when email was ubiquitous. Um, I think it existed. I do remember something along those lines, but it was not ubiquitous. Uh, so you had to, we actually, we wrote a letter to Derek Bell. He didn't know who we were from Adam, um, but he responded uh, to our letter, accepted our invitation, came and spent time with us, and he, he affirmed us, uh, and he helped us to understand that there was a future for our work and the way that we thought differently about the world, which is not always the way that he thought about the world, but he affirmed our views. And so before starting, I just want to affirm um, your sense um, that you do belong, that you do matter, and that this world and the future belongs to you. And with that, I want to think through first um, the principles that Derek Bell espoused in his work. Um, now, that's hard to do because the man wrote like, like eight, nine, ten books, just starting with the books itself, right? So that's a lot of stuff. Uh, luckily, I had a little bit of a head start. I started reading Derek Bell's work when I was in law school. Um, and he wrote well over 60 articles. Um, so to try to distill those things is uh, extremely difficult. So I would say, feel for me, and those of you who pray, <laughs> pray for me. Um, the second thing, though, that I want to do is I want to take those principles and then tell you a story. Um, and then I will close coming back on those principles. So five principles. The first, um, I think, will be self-evident, um, if you're at all familiar with Derek Bell's work, and it is about the permanence of racism. Uh, so he explored this theme, this axiom, in his 1992 Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism, where he argues that American racism is not an anomaly, but critically important stabilizing force that enables whites to bind across a wide socioeconomic real chasm. And that without the deflecting power of racism, masses of white Americans would likely wake up to and revolt against a severe disadvantage they suffer in income and opportunity when compared with those whites that are at the top of our socioeconomic heap. He also wrote, throughout the nation's history, it has been willing to sacrifice black rights, black interests, and even black lives to enhance the status, further the profits, and settle the differences among whites. And similarly, he penned the common held view of racial advancement as a slow but steady surge forward is wrong. It is a belief sustained by long held faith and unabashed fantasy. The man did not mince his words. Even though it provides a measure of civil rights progress that is more reassuring than accurate, in fact, what is deemed progress is cyclical rather than linear, right? The permanence of racism. The second um, axiom or principle, and those of you who are familiar with, with Derek's work won't surprise you, is the contingency of racial progress and interest convergence. His interest convergence thesis is this, that black people will only get relief from racial discrimination when and to the extent that it co coincides with the interests of whites. Right? He explored that theme specifically in his 1980 Harvard Law Review article. And there, Bell seeks to explain why racial desegregation has by and large failed less than 30 years after Brown. And of course, now more than 50 years after Brown, it is a similar story that when you look at what is happening with respect to race and education, that essentially you have um, whites generally attending schools with other whites, not always, but more or less. Um, generally, and folks of color, particularly black and Latino and Latinx, um, similarly so. Right, so Bell is trying to explain what, what happened to this concept and theory of integration that we're so proud of. And he argues that Brown and the court in Brown was never really committed to racial equality. Brown failed because it was not intended to succeed. What then was the court up to in Brown if Brown was not intended to succeed? And, Bre and Bell writes, the interests of blacks in achieving racial equality will be accommodated only when it converges with the interests of whites. 
However, the 14th Amendment, standing alone, will not authorize a judicial remedy providing effective racial equality for blacks, where the remedy sought threatens the superior societal status of middle and upper class whites. And he continued, it follows that the availability of 14th Amendment protection in racial cases may not actually be determined by the character of harm suffered by blacks or the quantum of liability proved against whites. Racial remedies may instead be outward manifestations of unspoken, perhaps subconscious, judicial conclusions that the remedies, if granted, will secure advance or at least not harm societal interests deemed important by middle and upper class whites. Racial justice or its appearance may from time to time be counted among the interests deemed important by the courts and by society's policymakers. That is the interest convergence thesis. The third, all right, if you're already depressed, I'm not going to help you. The third Bellian axiom is the limits of the civil rights model. All right, so first, permanence of racism. Second, interest convergence. So this is where interest convergence really is directed towards um, middle and upper class whites. But the limits of the civil rights model is directed at Bell's fellow black travelers. There, um, Bell talks about the fact that the civil rights model does not beget true equality. So in his famous 1976 Yale Law Journal article, Serving Two Masters, Bell explores the limitations of the civil rights framework, which for the most part tries to achieve desegregation instead of substantive equality. So using the context of school desegregation, he argues that what black parents wanted for their kids was good schools. That's what they wanted. Instead, what they got was a theory of desegregation. Why? Well, because that's what the lawyers wanted. The lawyers did so because that's the remedy they could get under the law. Right? They couldn't get the true thing, uh, which was substantive equality, good schools for their kids. But instead, they got the fake thing, um, desegregation orders, which they had to fight, but which isn't going to achieve the thing that they really wanted. Right? So the civil rights framework was limited both in what it can achieve, and, but also, more importantly, in its aspirations. The last two, perhaps, might surprise you. Number four is the value of resistance, the value of racial resistance. Right? Derrick Bell did not shy away from confrontation. In a 1995 Law Review essay titled uh, the, this 95 Law Review essay captured the sentiment perfectly in terms of what the purpose of this theme is. The title is The Triumph and Challenge. Not the triumph and change, not the triumph in achieving a particular goal, but the triumph and challenge, the challenge itself. Right? Um, cha triumph was in the challenge itself. His 1994 book, Confronting Authority, Reflections of an Ardent Protester, he articulated in his work that the goal of racial resistance is not necessarily change, but the goal is in the confrontation itself. It is in the confrontation that one is triumphant. And then the final theme, here the fifth one, is racial realism. And here, when you, we begin with the permanence of racism, we get the pragmatic bell. Because right? the question then is, if racism is permanent, if the civil rights model is limited, both in its, in its means as well as in its goals, um, if um, change only comes when it converges with the power framework, the racialized hierarchy, uh, then what is the point? Well, she says, well, the point is in the challenge, but is there something much more than that? Right? And this, then, is the fifth theme, that one needs to be realistic about what's possible in American society. That the failure to be realistic, particularly the failure, and here he's speaking specifically to black people, it's interesting how much of Derrick Bell's work um, directly, explicitly, spoke to black Americans, that the failure of black people to be realistic about what's possible leads to frustration and despair. 
but he was a very optimistic person. We don't need to be, we don't need to despair, we simply need to have a realistic understanding of how to achieve the gains, the small gains that one can get. We need to understand the framework within which we are working, and we need to understand the framework of what is possible, that we need to be realistic about race, right? the fifth theme, racial realism. I will now take these themes and then tell you a story, and hopefully you can begin to see how those themes play into this, the story. So now I leave Bell for a moment, though we never really leave him, and I go to my own work, because that work is deeply influenced by these Bellian principles. On May 5th, 1956, at 11.30 in the morning, Louise Lassiter, a resident of Seaboard, located in Northampton County, North Carolina, went to the polling booth. Well, she went actually to the local general store. And she didn't go there to shop, but she went there to register to vote because the local general store also functioned as the local registrar's office. Now, as a formal matter, she met all of North Carolina's statutory requirements for registration. At 41 years old, she was old enough. She lived in the precinct all of her life. She met the residency requirement. She wasn't a person convicted of a crime, so she was not automatically excluded. She was also not illiterate. She had completed at least one year of high school. And so if this was simply a question of meeting the formal legal requirements. This should have been an easy case. And Ms. Lassiter's experience would have been pretty straightforward, and her name would likely have remained unknown to constitutional history. But Louise Lassiter was a black woman who lived in the rural South in the 1950s in an, era with in, an, in an area with a substantial black population without the benefit and before the advent of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And by the first decade of the 20, 20th century, North Carolina had effectively disenfranchised almost all of its black citizens. Though there were more black citizens registered to vote in the mid-1950s North Carolina than there was at the beginning of, of the 20th century, most of the state's black citizens could not vote, and things were worse in the rural counties where people like Louise Lassiter lived and lived all of their lives. And while it was true that some things had changed by the 1950s in particular, North Carolina had abandoned its experiment with the whites-only party primary, which the Supreme Court had by then outlawed and overruled. North Carolina's political elites were no longer stuffing the ballot, and they were no longer manipulating the vote in order to dilute black voting rights. Widespread political violence as a tool of electoral control had certainly abated. And North Carolina no longer required people trying to register to vote to pay a poll tax as a prerequisite to registration. Right? So much had changed. But the state had retained its most powerful discriminatory tool, the literacy test. And under North Carolina law, as a prerequisite to registration, one had to take the literacy test. Ms. Lassiter certainly knew the challenge ahead of her when she went to the general store to register to vote. In addition to requiring voters to be literate, North Carolina had purported to excuse the lineal descendants of those who were entitled to vote in 1867 from being subjected to the literacy requirement. This grandfather clause, as it was known, um, was certainly unconstitutional. The court had held so in 1915. But North Carolina still had the law on the books in both its constitution as well as in its statutes. Now, whether it was being enforced or not was not clear, but the state had not gotten around to repealing neither the constitutional provision nor the statute. So for the rest of my time this evening, I want to tell a little bit of the story of Louise Lassiter and her unsuccessful effort to challenge North Carolina's literacy test. Her story paints in point pointillistic detail, a textured picture of the goals, strategies, difficulties faced by often unacknowledged local black and brown heroines. They help us to understand and to frame the five Bellian principles that I started us thinking about. Right? The relevance and permanence of racism, the interest convergence, 
the racial realism, the limits of the civil rights framework, um, and the purpose of struggle. There are many in the civil rights framework that we revere, such as Rosa Parks, as we should, but we don't remember the likes of Louise Lassiter. We know about Thurgood Marshall, rightly so, but we should also honor Samuel Mitchell, one of Ms. Ms. Lassiter's lawyers, who died penniless, in part because he dedicated his life to fighting racial discrimination in the South. No one knows James Walker, but he was a local lawyer who recruited Ms. Lassiter as a plaintiff. He initiated the lawsuit against the advice and without the support of the national NAACP. But he believed that his community needed this, and so he fought for it. Mr. Walker went on to law school. Um, he went to law school just to combat racial discrimination. Louise Lassiter's story, however, is useful for more than rendering homage to worthy protagonists. Her story, which would ultimately be heard by the Supreme Court under the caption Lassiter versus Northampton, vividly illustrates the effects of the Constitution's approach to the franchise. It helps us understand the power dynamics that is a reflection of the constitutional framework that we in fact have, that when we're thinking about race and democracy, when we're thinking about race and political power, that we have to pay attention to the foundational frameworks that curb structures how the franchise is accessed. Instead of granting the franchise and the right to vote as a privilege of national citizenship, the Constitution divides authority for voting rights, law, and policy through a structural division that divides power among the three different national institutions, the United States Supreme Court as a matter of course and practice, the federal government and particularly Congress, but also the states. And here, the states are the key and critical actor. The structural arrangement thus privileges the states as the primary actors in developing voting rights law and policy. And we can't come to terms with political power in this framework in this country without coming to terms with the constitutional framework. So allow me to make a few brief points. In order to understand the threat to voting, both present, past, present, and future, we have to understand then the grant of power granted to the states and the fact that the problem is unrestrained state power, that the constraints imposed by the Constitution upon the states with respect to their regulation of the franchise are few based on a limited set of negative prohibitions, such as the prohibition against sex, race discrimination, and so on, and those prohibitions are elastic. Because there are no meaningful constraints, structural constraints on the power of the states to regulate the franchise, the states have endless ways in which, um, in which to discriminate. Right. And the formal, and this is one of the lessons that Derek Bell teaches, the formal equality framework is insufficient to address that structural deficiency. So there's opportunity, but there's also motivation. Right. Sometimes racism serves as a motivation. Sometimes partisanship serves as a motivation. And sometimes the pure desire to maintain and hold and wield political power serves as a motivation. You could think about this as strategic disenfranchisement. Right? So if you're thinking about why we have the system that we have, you have to first begin to look at the structural framework established by the Constitution. Then you have to think about which provides the opportunity for disenfranchisement. But then you have to also think about the different types of motivation. Right? It is sometimes race, but not always race. It is sometimes partisanship, but not always partisanship. It also includes a pure desire to wield political power because people des desire to hold on and to use political power. There's a, so there's a second point for which that I want to use this case. And the second point is that um, it illustrates that the prohibition against racial discrimination in voting, while important, has its limitations. Right? So when Derek Bell helps us to teaches us um, the limits of formal equality and the limits of the civil rights model, 
this case and this framework demonstrates it in a fairly vivid way. Right? This was the 1950s. The 15th Amendment had been passed since 1870. It's weird to think about the fact that you, that the, the country uh, amended, which is not an easy thing to do, its foundational charter to address the problem of racial discrimination. And yet, notwithstanding that, we still had a deep and fundamental problem. And of course, if you're teaching this to your first year students, many of them will raise a puzzle. Wait a minute, if you had a constitutional amendment, how is it that the statute is going to help? Right? But I think what Bell teaches and helps us to understand and to explore, he teaches and shows how the constitutional framework, if it's not fully committed to the eradication of the problem root and branch, it will only continually persist. Right? That formal equality and legal rules can only do so much. And so the second lesson here is to think about the limits of the racialized framework. Third, Lassiter also illustrates and exemplifies the epistemic quagmire that we often find ourselves in when we're trying to think about racial discrimination. One of the things that you will see if you look at the Lassiter case eventually, you'll see that this is definitely 1950s North Carolina, that racism is ubiquitous, both in terms of intent, and I'll talk a little bit about that briefly in a moment, but also in terms of effect. And the hard part is, notwithstanding the fact that it was ubiquitous, the lawyers had a hard time proving it. And I will demonstrate why that is for you um, shortly. Right. We have an epistemic quagmire. We can't quite figure out how to prove what we know to be a reality. So despite a setting, or particularly in a setting in which everyone knew that racial discrimination was rampant, the legal system made it actually difficult to establish and prove racial discrimination. Now, Ms. Lassiter's lawyers, they were smart. They understood these dynamics. And so they attempted to shift course. They attempted to move the court from focusing on race, and you'll see shortly why that didn't work, to thinking about voting and political participation much more broadly. And that reminds us so much of Bell's insights. So the, imagine this for a moment, you're a civil rights lawyer, you spent lots of time in NAACP, you've dedicated a big portion of your life to it, and then you step back and you say, you know, but it didn't really do the thing that it was supposed to do. Right? And part of it is the focus on a particular thing, a particular racialized framework, and the importance of moving beyond that, and Lassiter illustrates this. And then one final point. And on this last one, I won't dwell, um, but I will just note that Lassiter allows us to preview the case for the Voting Rights Act and to perceive, if only faintly, the justification for the choices made by its drafters. From Lassiter, we can see why the act's creators opted for a particular racial frame. Right? And this is, again, part of what Bell helps us to understand, that the lawyers in um, the deseg and the school desegregation cases opted for a particular frame because it was dictated by the juridical uh, and doctrinal framework. OK, so a short return to our story. As I mentioned, in order to register to vote, Ms. Lassiter had to pass North Carolina's literacy test. She had to read and write a section of the state constitution, and she had to do so, and I quote, to the satisfaction of the registrar. And the discretion given to the local registrar was one of North Carolina's most powerful discriminatory tools. The registrar was the state's ace in the hole. Now, 
Miss Lassiter went to the registrar's office, the general store, really, early in the morning, but she didn't get to see the registrar until 5.30 in the afternoon, and it's likely that she was among a group of black women who tried to register so that they could vote in the upcoming election. The registrar, Helen Taylor, whose husband owned the general store, gave Miss Lassiter a copy of the state constitution, which Miss Lassiter was told to read. And Ms. Lassiter did not satisfy the registrar on that day. She mispronounced several words. And her testimony, that's all, she just mispronounced several words. And her testimony to a, to a volunteer civil rights commission later on, Louise Lassiter remarked everything had to be perfect in order to pass. And Louise Lassiter was not the only person who failed the test that day. Ms. Lassiter's lawyers allege that at least 25 people who were otherwise qualified to vote, but were denied by Ms. Taylor the right to register as voters by the application of the so-called literacy test. And that's what they called it, the so-called literacy test. Now, Louise Lassiter's story might have ended, up, ended there were it not for James Walker, the black North Carolina lawyer who was looking for plaintiffs to challenge the literacy test. So on February 25, 1957, Mr. Walker joined with two other lawyers and they filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of Louise Lassiter and similarly situated prospective voters. They named Ms. Taylor, the um, registrar, as the defendant. So here's what's interesting from, um, from this part of the story. The state, instead of um, responding to the lawsuit first, decided what, the, what they were going to do was they took this as an opportunity to amend the statute, though not the Constitution, to officially get rid of the grandfather clause. Right, so finally, they got rid of the grandfather clause. And then they argued, after they got rid of the grandfather clause, that they, as a sovereign state, had a right to pass a literacy test, right? and that the literacy test was not discriminatory. Now remember, for a very long time, the literacy test contained a grandfather clause. And the purpose of the grandfather clause, as I think we all know, was to allow whites to register to vote, but to deny it to blacks, right? to say if your grandfather voted at that particular time. And of course, only whites could vote at that particular time. So now they cleanse the statute from the grandfather clause, um, cleanse the, took out the, the grandfather clause and cleansed the statute, and then decided that um, they could defend the statute as a right, as their sovereign right, um, to pass a literacy test if they wanted to, because now there was no racial discrimination at all from their perspective. Ms. Lassiter's voting rights lawsuit certainly threatened to upend the racialized political hierarchy. But you also have to remember, this was also a time in which the court, period of time in which the court had decided Brown versus Board, which put the South's, the South's racialized social hierarchy in jeopardy and put the South in the, on the defensive. And so her lawsuit simply opened up yet another front. Um, and the South had also learned a lesson, and particularly in North Carolina, which is, look, um, as long we can still get racial discrimination if we're smart about it. And one of the things that we can do is to provide discretion to local actors. That's what they did in education, and they got, and, and they got away with it. And it's the first thing that they also attempted to do with, they attempted to do with respect to voting. So now this case goes to trial before the three-judge court. And at the hearing, which opened up with a very brief direct examination of Ms. Lassiter by Mr. Mitchell, one of the plaintiff's lawyers, he led her through the basic facts. Following the direct examination, one of the defendant's lawyers now stood for cross-examination. On cross-examination, Mr. Bridgers, one of the defendant's lawyers, asked Ms. Lassiter whether she could read and write. And she responded, 
You know I can read. I read for you before. Then he asked her to read Article 1, Section 8 of North Carolina's Constitution. Ms. Lassiter responded, I have already read it for you. The judge then instructed Ms. Lassiter to read the document, and she read as instructed. Now, I've looked at the transcript of the hearing, and it is clear from the transcript that Ms. Lassiter was able to read the provision, though not fully accurately. She struggled with some words, and it's probably fair to say that there were some words that she could not pronounce and others that she did not understand. So Mr. Bridges went on to ask her to spell a few words. So he asked her to spell charter. And she replied, no, I can't spell it. He asked her to spell charity, and she spelled it C-H-R-T-Y. He then asked her to spell corporation. She replied that she could not. He then asked whether she understood what she read, and she answered yes. He asked, will you tell the court what the section you read concerns? And she answers, it concerns the laws. He then asked, the laws with relation to what? And she answers, cooperation with the assemble. He then asked, you are talking about a corporation with the general assembly? Is that what this particular section dealt with? And she answers, yes. It's clear so far right, that the purpose is to dehumanize, and that was the system, is to dehumanize the plaintiff. He asked Ms. Lassiter if she can write, and he asked her to write a portion of the state constitution that he dictated to her. Now, imagine the scene for a moment. This is taking place before three judges. And by this point, one of the judges, Judge Parker, had had enough. The dehumanization of the plaintiff had been accomplished. Ms. Lassiter had filed a lawsuit to combat the state's racial discrimination, but really all that she managed to do so far was to show that she could not read well or understand much of what she read. As Mr. Bridgers, the, lawyer, the defendant's lawyer, painfully demonstrated, she didn't deserve to vote. That was the point. And so Judge Parker says, can't we shorten this examination? I wish you would, Judge Parker requested. But not even the plaintiff's appeal, the, pla the, the, the plaintiff appeal for mercy by the judge would convince Mr. Bridgers to relent. He wanted and he needed Ms. Lassiter to write Article I, Section 9 of the Constitution, and he would not be deterred. Ms. Lassiter did as she was instructed and took the dictation. Her handwriting was neat, tidy, and fairly legible. But not surprisingly, she misspelled a number of words. And there was one word that she did not even attempt to write. That word was Congress, putting a line in its place. And the moments earlier Judge Parker wanted the humiliation to end, his curiosity got the better of him. Let me see it, he demanded. And then he commanded, let it be filed. Ms. Lassiter's writing, proof of her deficiency, her lack of deservedness, was entered into the record as Exhibit D1. This continued on for two other plaintiffs, along with Ms. Lassiter, that filed the lawsuit. Their dehumanization was entered into the record, and they were made to show their deficiency right there before the court. And then it was the defendant's turn, Ms. Taylor. She testified on direct examination that during the period when she was a registrar, at this point for four years, she registered 49 black applicants, including some who transferred their registration to other precincts. In 1956, the year that the plaintiffs applied to register to vote, she testified that there were a total of 41 black applicants who applied to register. She registered 21 of the 41 and rejected 20. Her lawyer asked her whether she gave every applicant, white, black, Indian, those were his words, who appeared before her a similar test, and she replied affirmatively. And on direct examination, she testified in the five years that she had been a registrar, only one white person, this is undirect, right? only one white person had failed the test. 
So for the most part, she registered every single white applicant, but only a certain percentage of the black applicants. She testified that she barely remembered Ms. Lassiter, but that she did not give Ms. Lassiter the writing test. She testified that she um, gave the writing test to some other African-American potential plaintiffs. And she testified that the others, the other plaintiffs, um, couldn't read, nor could they write, and that's exactly what they said to her. What's interesting is the court, the three-judge court, not long thereafter, provided an opinion. The court credited Ms. Taylor's testimony that she administered the test fairly, declaring, and this is the court statement, without contradiction, the literacy test was applied by the registrar to white person and Negroes alike without discrimination. Although the court did not explain how Ms. Taylor, in her many years as a registrar, denied at least half of the black applicants, but only one white applicant who sought to register to vote. And though perhaps to the court the explanation seems self-evident, the plaintiffs, and by extension, unsuccessful black applicants, were clearly, from their perspective, not qualified to exercise the franchise. As the court remarked, the cross-examination, this is the court's words, the cross-examination of the three Negro women who were denied registration by the registrar amply established adequate basis for the denial of the literacy test, if the literacy test is valid. Though the court's phraseology here is less than pellucid, cryptic even, but it's very clear, and its import is relatively clear, that from the court's perspective, that the lower courts demonstrated to the court, the, the, the defendant's lawyers demonstrated to the court's satisfaction that the plaintiffs were simply not entitled to vote. Now, the, this lawsuit wound, returned back to um, the North Carolina courts and eventually made its way to the United States Supreme Court it was a function of a new strategy that the lawyers um, sought because they knew they were in a catch-22. They knew that um, one option was to return, this was the only op one option to, uh, before them, to return to Ms. Taylor and try to get their plaintiffs to um, take the test again. But of course, the, their catch-22 is that if, the, if Ms. Taylor passed, um, their plaintiffs, then they would have to start all over again to challenge the literacy test. That was a difficulty. On the other hand, um, if she failed them, she's already proven to the federal district court that she applied in a fair manner. So instead of challenging the literacy test on racial grounds, they challenged it both on race and on the fact that there was a fundamental right to vote. And here, this is the case that they took to the United States Supreme Court, which granted cert in this case. And we're talking about the Warren Court. So the lawyers perhaps probably were extremely ecstatic because they thought finally they were before the US Supreme Court, the Warren Court and um, that they were going to get a hearing in which the court would understand precisely what is happening. Unfortunately, the lawyer's hope was misplaced, and perhaps their prediction that they were going to win was also misplaced. In many respects, Lassiter, this Lassiter case, was not a typical Warren Court case. The constitutional categories here did not fit into the way that the court thought about it. The court wanted to see a pure race discrimination case, and it was hard, as the lawyers tried to do, to prove and show race discrimination, and they couldn't. So they tried to argue that there was a fundamental right to vote that was being violated by the literacy test. The problem that the lawyers faced was very clear from the beginning at oral argument, as soon as oral argument began. Sam Mitchell took the podium, one of the black lawyers for Ms. Lassiter, took the podium and started, to argue, and started his opening argument. And the justices were both unsure as to the point he was making, and they were uninterested in the arguments other than, could he prove racial discrimination? So Justice Felix Frankfurter, 
was the quickest of the draw. And of course, if you studied Felix Frankfurter, you know that he is characteristically direct. So he says, what is it that you're complaining of? Are you complaining that North Carolina can't pass, can't have a literacy test, he asked? Or are you complaining that it operates the literacy test against Negroes and not whites? Is that what you're complaining of? And it's not surprising that Felix Frankfurter would be the one to ask and frame his question in this way. If you're familiar with the voting cases, you would know that Felix Frankfurter um, believed that, look, if there's a problem of racial discrimination and you could prove racial discrimination, um, then the court will provide you with relief. But in Culver, Grove versus Green, Felix Frankfurter wrote for the court, if the problem is one of politics, then you can't get relief. And the oral argument went along those lines with the justices trying to pin the lawyers down, the plaintiff's lawyers down, and trying to see, understand if they could prove a race claim and not a voting claim. And of course, not surprisingly, not too long after oral argument, in a nine to zero decision, Lassiter's lawyers lost. So here's the question then, and this is where I'll begin my close. The question then, what ought we take from this process? How ought we think about the saga that is the Lassiter case? Let me return then to the Bellian principles. When you look across history, and you look across um, our history with discrimination and voting, it's pretty clear that the problem of racial discrimination in voting has, is one that has been with us since the very beginning. Though its manifestations have changed, right? and Bell um, was very clear about how racism morphs, but it remains a question that we are still struggling with and trying to figure out how to address. If you ask Professor Bell then, he would say, the Lassiter case is not surprising. It is a reflection of the, of the American reality. And in a context in which notwithstanding the social and political subordination that afflicted black people in particular, that one would have a hard time proving and showing racism, that even the Brown court, right, the Warren court, the most theoretically liberal court in our nation's history, could not see its way to either thinking about this case and the difficulties faced by the plaintiff's lawyer as a race case, or thinking about this case as a right to vote case, leaving aside the race question, because it is occluded um, by um, the, uh, the permanence and framework that racism imposes upon all of us. Bell would tell us that change comes, but it only comes when the interests converge, and that is how he would explain the 1965 Voting Rights Act. All right, that was a reflection of violence on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And so it was in the interest of the nation to show that it was doing something about this problem. And that brought together the interests of voters of color as well as the white power structure. But Bell would also tell us, and he would also try to explain, the 2013 Shelby County case in which the court struck down some important sections of the Voting Rights Act. Bell would say the civil rights model has its limits. It has its limits not just in the fact that the lawyers for Ms. Lassiter in a context rife with racial discrimination could not show discrimination, but it has its limits in the context of today when we are struggling with similar, from a Bellian perspective, sets of questions. But Bell would also say that there is triumph in confrontation. Right, that part of what the civil rights lawyers did, part of what Mr. Mitchell did, what Mr. Walker did, Ms. Lassiter's lawyers, even though they lost, and Louise Lassiter lost in the state courts, she lost in the federal courts, even though they lost, and they knew they were going to lose in many respects, so they hoped not, that there is triumph in the confrontation. Louise Lassiter would eventually get her right to vote, 
would eventually be able to register to vote even before the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And here then we come to Bell's racial realism. Progress may not be linear. Progress may in fact be slow. Progress may be incremental. But one of the things that we need to do is to understand when to take that progress. We need to understand what is possible within our framework and we need to push the boundaries whenever we can. We need to both be optimistic um, as well as realistic. We also need to understand the structures and this is why I begin with the underlying structure of the Constitution and how it makes accessing the right to vote quite difficult, that there are structural underpinnings to inequality, including racial inequality. And so I want to leave you with this, because it is Derrick Bell quoting Thurgood Marshall in a tribute to the great justice, one great dissenter speaking to another across time. And now they speak to us. So Bell, and the voice of Marshall says, we must go against the prevailing wind. We must dissent from indifference. We must dissent from apathy. We must dissent from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We must dissent from a government that has left its young without jobs, education, or hope. We must dissent from the poverty of vision and the absence of moral le leadership. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so I teach election law, um, and really it's, it's a, and I don't mean this in a bad way, it's actually a great time to teach election law. Um, and one of the things that we, that we think and talk about are um, things like this. Um, and here's, this is what my view um, is on this uh, stuff, I'll, and I'll try to be um, clear and quick. I do think that there's something important to norm enforcement, right? I think part of what's interesting about Derek Bell's, um, you know, I, I remember uh, the Harvard protest. You know, I was, it was right around, I was in law school and grad school, sort of right, right around there, and I was an aspiring legal academic, okay? Um, and the man had a job at Harvard Law School, which, you know, not a bad place to be, I imagine, um, right? And, uh, and he walked away in many respects. And I think it's to make a statement about the importance of values and principles and norms, right? Whether it was gonna affect weight change or not. Um, while it is true that we are consequentialist people, we don't do things for the sake of just doing things, right? Um, but it is also true that we are expressive people, right? We also do things for the sake of expressing certain types of values, right? Art matters because of how it makes us feel, the consequences that it has, but it matters just to express beauty for the sake of expressing beauty, right? It matters for us to express our shared democratic norms, whether or not they're going to have an immediate impact or not, right? 
And so from my perspective, as someone who tries to think about um, democracy and tries to think about democratic theory and tries to think about the, the um, you know, sort of these types of questions, um, I think norm reinforcement um, is, right, it's, a, it's a version of confronting authority. Norm reinforcement matters. And I would follow Bell here. Um, there is triumph and the challenge. There's, triumph is not simply in, in um, change. There is triumph and change without a doubt, right? Um, as I said, we are consequential people, consequentialists. It matters to us what the consequences are and that we effectuate change. All of us, no matter which perspective you're coming from. Um, but an important lesson is, you know, sometimes it, it may not make the consequences, have the consequences that you want, but there's, there's triumph in the challenge. I hope that's a direct, indirect answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Any others? Yes, right. As a current black law student, what would your advice be when it comes to the exhaustion you feel when you're facing the confrontation as well as pushing at that contingency that you mentioned? Sure. Um, so I've actually thought about this. Um, and I'm going to give you um, two answers. First, it's okay to be exhausted. All right? that, that's, there's, um, it's human to be exhausted, and we're all humans, and, and these, are, um, these are fights that one has to, that we have to fight. Um, you know, I fought them as a law student, but they're perpetual. I mean, this is when, when, when Derek Bell talks about the permanence of racism, I don't think, this is my read, I don't think he means that it's the same exact fight in the same way. Uh, but the hard part, especially as a person of color in this society, uh, you're going to have to address these questions in one form or another um, as long as you remain a person of color in this society. And so it's okay to be exhausted, and it's okay to take a time out, and it's okay um, to acknowledge one's exhaustion. Okay. At the same time, however, and this is how I think about it, it's just my answer, it doesn't have to be yours, it doesn't have to be anybody else's, but it's just mine. Um, at the same time, however, I think about the fact that um, I wouldn't be where I, w I am today if people quit. All right? I wouldn't be where I am if they decided that they were too exhausted to continue to fight on. Um, and this is a part of a lesson from, for me from people like Derek Bell or Judge Keith and others whom um, uh, I've had the privilege of interacting with. Um, it is a privilege and an honor to be a part of the struggle. It is a privilege and an honor to be a part of the fight. It is a privilege and an honor to be, as just Judge Keith would put it, a foot soldier for justice, quoting um, King, um, right? And so, so there are times in which we focus on, look, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. That's fair. Uh, but at the same time, um, change happens because some people just did not give in to being tired. Uh, and I think it is self-indulgent, quite frankly, um, to say, you know, I'm tired of fighting this, I'm tired of doing this, I'm tired of doing that. Um, <coughs> because doors have been opened to us because lots of people, notwithstanding how difficult it was for them, um, continued on, and they took it as a point of pride. Um, and so for me, I think it is a privilege uh, to be um, in a position where one can push and one can ask and one can cajole and one can demand. Um, while at the same time recognizing one's humanity um, and taking time to acknowledge one's humanity. But it must be both, right? It must be a recognition, but also the privilege of the obligation. leave him out of the acknowledgement, but I'm delighted to see all of you members of the law school community, the university, 
Eugene and beyond. So thank you again for joining us for the 2020 Derrick Bell Lecture, and we look forward to seeing you again next year.